Well, now I think we're going to have to say thanks to Sam and the group, because there was a group up here, not just a team. You look good. Thanks. <clears throat> Exegesis is when you take the scriptures and you allow them to share uh, their truth with your own life and with your own heart. Eisegesis, however, is when you take your truth and you impose it on the scripture, whether or not that imposition is actually valid. So this morning, reading on Facebook, my good friend Joel Gregory was uh, guilty of eisegesis because he used that passage in, in which Paul talks about the fact they were really not of us and so they left us. And he made that application to Oklahoma football and to... Um, University of Texas football, who of course are departing for the Southeastern Conference, and he made mention in passing that both of them just happened to lose yesterday in terms of uh, that particular athletic competition. And oh, by the way, P.S., he said Baylor beat Iowa State. Well, I did write him and say, he, he, he described it as faulty exegesis. I wrote him and said, no, it's just eisegesis. You're just reading your truth into the scripture so that it will suit your own your own moment. Interesting day in terms of college athletics, wasn't it? Uh, lots of fascinating, uh, interesting games. We, we stayed up a little later last night than I usually do on a Saturday night to watch uh, the outcome of the, uh, the A&M and Arkansas game. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it was a, a fascinating day. What a delight it is to, to, to share with you again this morning. Now let's move from the silly to the serious. Uh, as we turn back to our study of the Ten Commandments and, and we look at Exodus 20, um, this time we're looking at the commandment that has to do with the name of God. Single verse, verse 7. Uh, once again, let me invite you to stand with me as we read God's Word. If you're able, if not, it's, it's, it's okay. From the New International Version of the Bible, Exodus 27 says... Uh, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Uh, Father, take these moments together. and May we understand in a fresh and a new way the importance of, of not only words, Father, but, but the thoughts that we have behind the words that we say. Uh, and, and to that end, Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts and minds truly be pleasing and acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Ran across a statement in, in, in preparing for this morning's message this week that I had never run across before, that I... I think has a great deal to say to us about the reality behind this particular commandment regarding the name of the Lord. And the commentator made a simple statement. He said, if you consider it, thoughts are things. Thoughts are things. The image we have in our own mind of a particular reality will ultimately be reflected in our own lives, in, in how we live or, or how we don't live. Thoughts are things. When you come to this particular commandment, um, you're dealing with an Old Testament concept regarding the importance of names. Just a few verses. Psalm 8, 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Psalm, 100, uh, Psalm 111, verse 9. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Matthew 6, 9, when, when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, you remember how he taught them to begin the prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy, holy is your name. You see, in the Old Testament, in, in fact, through, throughout all of Scripture, 
Names carried with them great significance. It, it was not just a moniker. Your name actually was a reflection of who you were, of, of what you consider to be important, of, of what you valued and cherished most in life. So, uh, and, and the scriptures are replete with examples of that. For example, Jacob, whose name means heel holder or supplanter, trickster, cheater, once he encounters God at Bethel, comes to be called Israel, the prince of God, because he's now a man of faith. He's not perfect. He's going to stumble again. But his whole life had been transformed by that encounter so that he was now a new man, and his new name reflected that new identity. Israel, prince of God. The prophets were named with specific things in mind. Isaiah's name means the salvation of the Lord. Jeremiah's name means the Lord hurls in power and in majesty. Malachi means Yahweh's messenger. Jesus, mean, uh, Jesus means the Lord saves, God saves. And you remember we talked uh, some weeks ago about how Hosea, naming his children, gave some indication as to the message the prophet was seeking to communicate with his own society. Jezreel, Loruhama, Loami. A person was actually felt to be present in the name given to him. So, so God's name tells us something of who he is and what he does. In the scripture, there are actually around 950 different titles, if you would, names given to God. Jehovah Jireh, etc. God's name is precious and holy. It is filled with the reality of power and sovereignty. Because the names given to God are a way of telling us and helping us to understand who he is and what it is he wants to do in our world and in our lives. God's name is precious and holy, the most excellent name of all. So the Bible talks to us about the name of God and how we're to handle it. You could call on the name of the Lord, Genesis 4, 26. You could prophesy in his name, Jeremiah 11, verse 21. You could bless the name of the Lord, Psalm 72, 19. You could praise the name of the Lord in Psalm 69, 31. You could trust in his holy name in Isaiah 50, 10. You could seek refuge in his name, Ze Zephaniah 3:12. But you could also profane the name of the Lord, Leviticus 23. You could blaspheme his name, Leviticus 24, 16. You could curse his name, 2 Kings 2, 24. You could defile his name, Exodus 43, 8. You could abuse his name, Proverbs 39. You could swear falsely by his name, Leviticus 19, 12. And there are other many, many other passages that talk about how it is we are to handle and to reverence and to respect the name of God. Literally, this command says, you must not lift up the name of God emptily, groundlessly, in vain, or without result. Because his name reflects his nature. And the way we use his name, the way we think about his name, shows who we are and where our loyalties reside. Thoughts are things. So what you think, how you think, is reflected in how you live. The problem, you see, and, and this is our first point in this morning's message, the problem is profanity. Profane means, um, it comes from the Latin words pro in front of and fane, which means the temple. So it's that which would not have access to or would not be welcome within the temple, something that is, in fact, ungodly. The word for vain is the word shaw in the Hebrew language, used some 52 times in the Old Testament. It designates anything that is unsubstantial, insignificant, unreal, worthless, 
either materially or morally empty. It, it describes idols and, and, and the words of false prophets. Their words are shaw, they're, they're empty, they're, they're useless. Profanity means that you might swear falsely in God's name, but also it is a reference to using God's name lightly in any context. Profanity is the problem. It's a problem in two areas. It, it's a problem in terms of what we say, how we use language, how we use the name of God. I, I played athletics in high school and for a couple of years at Baylor, and uh, profanity was just a part of the scene. I never liked it. I was never comfortable with it, but it was a reality. And you have to watch that you don't become desensitized to it. I mean, I had one of my grandkids came to me the other day with a question that I never, ever, ever, ever thought I would have to answer. Daddy, granddad, they said, Pawpaw is my name. Pawpaw, is putting OMG on a Facebook post profanity? OMG. Well, first I had to go ask my daughter what OMG meant. <laughs> and then I had to go back to Harper, my, my granddaughter, and I had to say to her, well, yeah, it, it really is. She said, well, some of my friends say that the G refers to goodness. And I said, well, uh, okay, but a whole lot of people see the G as being a reference to God, so probably it would be better that you use a different moniker. You know, this is the area that, that I think we're, um, we're most familiar with. When, when I was a kid, you would never hear words of profanity on television programs. You can't hear a television program today and, uh, unless it's on what used to be the Hallmark Channel uh, and w without hearing profanity in various shapes and forms and fashions. Uh, it, language has become an interesting conundrum because we're hearing more and experiencing more and seeing more and in some cases reading more words than we've ever read before but with less insight with less meaning with less understanding than ever before so at its heart one of the things that this commandment is telling us use your words carefully i used to you know, I asked my high school coach one day, and this was after I had already graduated, I, I said, do you ever really think about the words you use when you're trying to motivate your players? I, I mean, do you ever really think about what hell is? Do you ever think about what the word damn actually means? I was braver in those days than probably I am now. And he had a he had a kind of a typical response. He was a good man, but not particularly a man of faith. You see, the problem with empty, profane language is that it neither expresses faith nor worship. You, you, you can't do it. Um, and, and we won't turn and read, but sometimes and we'll study on Sunday night before long, James 3, verses 9 through 12, where it talks about the, the tongue and and how out of the mouth comes words that can bless and words that can curse. Um, in no other realm of human endeavor is such a small thing so powerful. So one of the things I think God is saying to us is, as you use my name, use it carefully. Choose your words carefully. But the more significant issue, I think, raised by this commandment is not just about what we say, not using the Lord's name in vain, but it has to do with the superficiality of how we live. If we talk like we're people of faith, and yet our lives don't reflect that reality to the casual observer, you see a problem in that? 
I mean, that's one of those places where James is going to speak to us, and again, we won't go to those passages, but James is going to talk about professing to be a person of faith and yet living as a worldling, not as a Christ follower, but as somebody who's just as crash, crass and ambitious and superficial as everybody else on the face of the earth. I believe profanity in language is horrible. I think it's something we need to work to avoid whatever the cost. I think profanity in life, though, in terms of how we live, is an even more serious issue. How can we say something that our lives indicate we don't really and truly believe? So in Isaiah, the very first chapter, beginning in verse 12, when you come to appear before me, this is the prophet speaking on behalf of God to the, to the inhabitants of Israel, uh, to the inhabitants of Judah. When, when you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my court? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your, your incense is detestable, new moon, Sabbath, convocations. I can't bear your evil assemblies. Your festivals and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. And then he gives the reason, because your hands are full of blood. Because your lives reflect the fact that you are far from me and care nothing of my will for your life or for the life of the nation. It, it's all about how we live. And how you live reflects the, the values, the treasures of your heart. I was reading a commentator this week who, who called 21st century Christendom um, in terms of the level of faith commitment that some people demonstrate. He called it sort of vague Christianity, kind of casual superficial it's about what we say it's about how we live if that's the problem the problem is profanity what's the solution the solution is sensitivity sensitivity to our own commitments one of the things I think this commandment means to us is that we make a vow before God we keep it that's true in terms of human relationships, things like marriage, business contracts, arrangements, personal promises. Your word becomes the thing that binds you. And your words actually reflect the character of your mind and your heart and your soul. Because the commitments and longings of your heart eventually shape the kind of person you become. Years ago, uh, my grandfather, on my dad's side of the family, homesteaded uh, on the high plains of Texas, uh, south of Lubbock, uh, a little ways. And he and his wife, Edna, moved from Mason, Texas, and they, they started their, their life as, as farmers in West Texas in a half dugout, you know, the edge of a hill where they dug out a place to live and they put up a few boards for shelter. Uh, they stayed in that half dugout for, for about two years. Um, but my grandfather was a hard worker and, and had an excellent sense of, um, of, of how to grow things. He, he, he was a wonderful farmer. Started out with, with mules as his um, uh, machinery, pulling a single row plow. Uh, when they came out with me mechanization for agriculture, uh, he was convinced it was a fad that would never last. In, in fact, in the little community where he lived, a, a, a local man had, had set up a tractor dealership and was selling John Deere tractors, and, and, uh, and he was offering to take mules in trade for tractors. Um, and so uh, I believe it was five mules uh, that plus a little bit of money, and you got a tractor. 
Uh, granddad selected out five mules and started toward town. He told me later this story that, that three times while he was on his way, he turned around to go back because he just knew these, these tractor things would never last. He just knew he was making a mistake. But he finally arrived at town, got the tractor, took it home. Within two weeks, he had sold every mule he had and had bought another tractor so that his eldest son could drive the tractor too. Uh, I told you all of that to tell you that uh, Granddad bought land in West Texas before they actually discovered petroleum in West Texas. And so one day, a guy showed up at my grandfather's house uh, and um, said to him, hey, I, I represent the, this particular oil company, and, and we want to purchase your, the mineral rights to your land. And what this, this means is that we have the right to come and to drill uh, and to look for oil on your property, and if we discover oil, you get a very generous percentage <laughs> of the product that is recovered. And what we propose to do is to, to buy these mineral rights from you, I think at that time, uh, granddad told me it was for a, like a dollar an acre. Well, that was, a, I mean, that was a lot of money. And so as they visited and, and walked out of the house, granddad said, I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll make that commitment. Let's, let's, let's get started. And he said, okay, well, I have some paperwork to draw up, and I'll, I'll come back in a couple of days, and I'll have a check for you, and we'll, we'll move forward. They shook hands. They left. Later that day, granddad went into town, and he was visiting with some friends, and he said, hey, I had a guy from an oil company come out and talk to me, and they said, oh, yeah, they're all over this country now. They've discovered oil uh, not too far from here, and so they have reason to believe there's lots of oil under the ground all around, and, and they said, did you sell him your mineral rights? I said, well, I agreed to. I didn't sign anything, and they said, well, what'd you sell him? A dollar an acre, and he said, oh, hire him. That's one-third the going rate. Everybody else is getting $3 an acre. You didn't sign anything? He said, no, I didn't sign anything. He said, well, then you're not obligated. You didn't sign anything. I mean, think about it. This guy was cheating you. He was tricking you. He knew what he was doing. He was being dishonest with you. And, and my grandfather, and it was my dad who told me this story, not granddad. He would never have said this about himself. But my granddad looked at his friends and he said, I'm sorry, you know, I, I appreciate your good intentions, but I will sell my mineral rights for the amount that we agreed upon because I shook his hand. And for 15 years, my word has been my bond in this community, and I'm not about to change it now. That, that's what this commandment is about. When you make a commitment, you keep a commitment. Because the things you, you cherish, the things you love, the things you admire have a way of shaping you and making you. You remember Nathaniel Hawthorne's story about the, grain sto the great stone face? You remember that? Little boy, there's a mountain that, 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 uh, that looked like someone had carved an, an image out of the edge of, of the mountain. And this little boy was fascinated by that image, and all of his life he looked at it, and he loved it, and he admired it. And, and the conclusion of the story indicates that uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne said that at the, end of his life, he, at the end of his life, this young boy looked exactly like the image on the mountain. His face had taken on the countenance of the image. That which you love, that which you give yourself to, that which you cherish, shapes you. It was Ralph Waldo Emerson who said, a man is what he thinks about all day long. Marcus Aurelius said, our life is what our thoughts make of it. And then, of course, Proverbs 23, 7 as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Let your commitments shape your life. But I think another element of, of this commandment has, has to do with the fact that we need to be sensitive to God's wonderful provision for us, for the way in which he has provided for our lives, the way in which he has blessed us and touched us and, and made life different in so many positive and, and incredible ways. 
Think about the children of Israel who were hearing this command. In essence, God was saying, when you use my name, think about your own journey. Think about your own pilgrimage. Captive in a land, I liberated you. I provided food for you in the desert. I helped you defeat those enemies who dared to attack you. And I'm getting ready to give you a land that I promised you centuries ago. So when you use my name, bring into that conversation an awareness on your part of everything that I have done for you. We talk about God a lot, especially in the family called church. Could it be that sometimes we've talked so much the words have lost some of their impact in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts? The great African-American preacher, Gardner Taylor, who was at Concord Baptist Church in Brooklyn for more than 40 years, said the following in a sermon that I've always liked. Our God is, a, is as great as God is good and good as God is great. And this is to say marvelous things about both God's goodness and God's greatness. The God we serve merits our reverence, our bowed heads, our bent knees, trembling spirits, the touch of a whisper in our voices, unstudied pauses of silence when we talk with God and, and God talks with us. Our, our God is different from us creatures, but God is as God ever was and was as God ever will be. Does that touch your spirit, your soul, just a little bit? There are so many people to whom God has been exceedingly good and abundantly kind. How, how marvelous this life is because God has opened a way for us, a way of good health, good fortune, good circumstances. And because of his love and care, we should in turn offer our lives, our time, our loyalty, and our love to God. We love God because God first loved us. God is love. That's what defines him. What do you think? about when you think about God and his name. Wilbur Rees uh, had a little ditty that he wrote that I've always kind of liked. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love a black man or to pick beets with a migrant. I want ecstasy. I don't want transformation. I want warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to have $3 worth of God, please. Could it be that we've talked about him and his work so long that he's become overly familiar to us. And, and I close with, with this story. Um, it, it's a story that, that Francis Barclay um, tells. Actually, Florence Barclay, I'm sorry. When um, she was a little girl, the first church that the young, the, the first church service that the younger children were allowed to attend uh, was a service on Good Friday. And so she and several of her friends went with their families to the Good Friday service. And there was a very special friend of Florence's who was with her mother and was listening very intently to the sermon delivered by the pastor. This is what Florence said. The long story of the crucifixion was read and beautifully told. 
My friend heard Peter deny, and he heard, she heard Judas betray. She heard Pilate's bullying cross-examination. She saw the crown of thorns, the buffeting of the soldiers. She heard of Jesus being delivered to be crucified. And then came those words with their terrible finality. And there, on that hill, they crucified him. No one in the church seemed to care, but suddenly my friend's face changed forever. And she began to weep loudly enough so that all in the auditorium heard her. How could they, she said. How could they do that? Why did they do that? I love that little girl. Because when she experienced the story of the crucifixion for the first time, she depicted what our reaction ought to be every time we hear it. Have we heard it so often? Have we seen it in our own mind's eye so regularly, so continuously, that it no longer touches us at the deepest part of our being? If it has, we're guilty of transgressing this commandment because we have failed to understand with fresh eyes and with deep gratitude everything that God has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in church... We talk about God a lot, and the answer to every question is Jesus. We, we know that. We understand that. But when was the last time you looked at Calvary long enough to be touched and to be changed by the reality of what happened there, to be touched and to be changed forever? by God's love that was that broad and that deep and that transformational. Casual language is a serious issue, and I'd like to go back to the 50s in terms of TV words. But I think the worst sin of all is a life casually lived without regard for the purpose and the plan and the direction of God. Understanding how it is he wants us to live and then giving everything we have, everything we are, everything we can to that journey of discipleship. Lord, I want to be what you want me to be. You have changed me. And now, Lord, I want you to shape me. And every time I look at the cross, I want my heart to be broken. I want my spirit to be challenged. I want my life to be changed. Because that's why there is a cross. So what are you thinking today? What's in your mind or what's in your heart? Thoughts are things, if you think about it. And they can draw us closer to God through Christ or they can drive us away from God because we turn from Christ. It's all about what we think. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the truth of your word and for the opportunity you have given to us to live as obedient disciples. Father, may we never 
take your name or use your name lightly or casually or, or even comfortably, Father. But most importantly, Father, may our lives reflect the fact that you are more precious to us than anything else in all of creation. Thank you for loving us enough to provide for us exactly what we need. Thank you, Father, for changing our lives forever through faith in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May he be more real to us today than perhaps he has ever been before in this journey of life called discipleship. Guide us now in the closing moments of this service that what we do would honor and serve our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our, our song of...